who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. Good morning, everyone. Take just a moment here for things to get organized. Significant change has come to our world over the last year. Many things we have taken for granted in the past are now in question. For example, the idea of, of uh, going to visit family and seeing children and grandchildren, something that used to be totally predicated on can you afford to go and can you afford the time off from work? That was kind of the two big questions. But now you might be able to afford to travel and you might have the time, but your relatives might not even want to see you. for fear you might be a viral carrier of disease. When one looks at the world right now, optimism isn't the first impression you come away with. The things, the realities in our world that are visible are not generally encouraging right now. And I actually wrote that early this week. Today, the message that I have for you, which I believe is present truth, in other words, truth that is relevant today, is that there are realities that are not visible to the naked human eye that give those who can see by faith great reason to hope in the knowledge that Jesus Christ is watching every move that's made. Every situation that develops he hears every cry, he sees every tear that falls, and he observes every injustice that is imposed upon humanity. I'll tell you what I'm, my target is for today. My goal and hope today is that we can be given the faith to see with heavenly vision to hear the sounds of heavenly music and be encouraged that all is not lost. God is not surprised by anything that happens on this earth. 
my prayer today, folks, is because of our daily experience as our traveling companion, that we will be fountains of hope to those other travelers on our journey. I turned the page too quick. So we're gonna look at some scripture today in the book of Hebrews. And I've chosen to use a modern language translation. And uh, this verse refers to the verses that went before it. And it says, the, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, the faith that I'm talking about that, that helps you to see the invisible realities that guide us. This faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by the God's word. What we see created by what we can't see. You have to think about that for a minute. I'll say it again. What we see when we look out the windows of the church, when we look at the beautiful scenery of Alaska, we see a creation that was brought into place by agencies that we don't see, that are invisible to the human eye. We live in a dangerous world. I wrote this over a week ago. And a lot of people are fearful today. The life that we live, the life that we lead, can be, could be called a dangerous journey. Psalms 23 says, talks about the valley of the shadow. And certainly many of us have gone through that valley. What Peter says about the final days in 1 Peter 5, 8 to 11, he says, keep a cool head, stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. You're not the only ones plunged into these hard times. It's the same with Christians all over the world. So keep a firm grip on the faith. The suffering won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ. Eternal and glorious plans they are. That God will have you put together and on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Yes, he does. So let's look at a, a further context of those who have lived before the heroes of old. Women received their loved ones back from the dead. There were those who under torture refused to give in and go free, preferring something better, resurrection. In other words, this is saying they preferred to die and go to the grave, trusting in God and trusting in the resurrection. Other brave, others braved abuse and whips and yes, chains and dungeons. <clears throat> we have stories of those who are stoned, sawed in two, murdered in cold blood. Stories of vagrants wandering the earth in animal skins, homeless, friendless, powerless. The world did not deserve them. They made their way as best they could on the cruel edges of the world. 
Not one of these people, even though their lives were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised. God had a better plan for us that their faith and our faith would come together to make one completed whole. Then the Apostle Paul starts Hebrews chapter 12, referring back to the chapter that went before. Such a large cloud of witnesses all around us. So we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially the sin that won't let go. And we must be determined to run the race that is ahead of us. We must keep our eyes on Jesus who leads and makes our faith complete. He endured the shame of being nailed to the cross because he knew that later on he would be glad he did. Now, he is seated at the right side of God's throne. So keep your mind on Jesus, who put up with many insults from sinners. Then you won't get discouraged and give up. Now, stand up straight, he says. Stop your knees from shaking and walk a straight path. Then lame people will be healed instead of getting worse. Now I have a... <clears throat> A story that illustrates the point <clears throat> that that God is watching every part of our lives. In our study in Genesis on Tuesday night, we've just looked uh, Genesis 16 about the story of Hagar Sarah's handmaid who was given to Abraham to have a baby with and uh, as you can imagine uh, cordial rel relations broke down in that family and Sarah disciplined her servant girl and Hagar ran and she headed back toward Egypt where she came from and on the way the Bible calls the angel the angel of the Lord which in most places refers to God himself so God himself cares enough about this servant girl from Egypt that he catches up with her on the journey, finds her at an oasis, and he says, Hagar, servant girl of Sarah, where are you going? And he tells her to go back to her mistress, to serve her time, her baby would be born, become a great nation, and God wanted to bless her. And Hagar called God by a name that we would do well to recognize. She said, I'm going to call you the God who sees. The God who sees me. And Hagar was, I don't know what she knew, but she learned from that experience. She went back to Sarah now, I'm not going to say they lived happily ever after because they did not. And, uh, of course, the Israelis and the PLOs are the, con PLO are the continuing of that situation. But the God who sees, the God who sees me, that's the reality that I'm preaching about today. So now to the story. And if I can't make it through the story, somebody else might have to finish. But I've become quite an emotional old geezer 
And um, I used to be pretty stoic. So we see here an attractive young lady and age 34. Because of a misdiagnosis, she has become blind, totally blind. And the passengers on the bus watch sympathetically as the attractive young woman with the white cane made her way carefully up the steps and onto the bus. She paid the driver and using her hands to feel the location of the seats. She walked down the aisle and found the seat the driver had told her was empty. Then as she settled in, she placed her briefcase on her lap and rested her cane against her leg. It had been just a year since Susan became blind. She had been rendered sightless and she was suddenly thrown into a world of darkness, anger, frustration, and self-pity. Once a fiercely independent woman, Susan now felt that this terrible twist of fate had condemned her to being a powerless, helpless burden to everyone around her. How could this have happened to me, she would plead, her heart knotted with anger. But no matter how much she cried or ranted or prayed, she knew the painful truth. Her sight was never going to return. A dark cloud of depression hung over Susan's once optimistic spirit. Just getting through each day was an exercise in frustration and exhaustion. All she had to cling to was her husband, Mark. Mark was an Air Force officer and he loved Susan with all his heart. When she first lost her sight, he watched her sink deeper and deeper into despair and was determined to help his wife gain the strength and confidence she needed to become independent again. Mark's military background had trained him well to deal with sensitive situations, yet he knew this was the most difficult battle he would ever face. Finally, Susan felt ready to return to her job, but how would she get there? She used to take the bus to and from work, and now she was too afraid to venture about the city all by herself. Mark volunteered to drive her to work each day, even though they worked at opposite ends of the city. At first, this comforted Susan and fulfilled Mark's need to protect his sightless wife who was so insecure about performing the slightest task. Soon, however, Mark realized that this arrangement wasn't working. It was both hectic and costly. Susan is going to have to start taking the bus again by herself, he admitted to himself. But just the thought of mentioning it to her made him cringe. She was so fragile and so angry how would she react? And just as Mark predicted, Susan was horrified at the idea of taking the bus again. I'm blind, she responded bitterly. How am I supposed to know where I'm going? I feel like you're abandoning me. Mark's heart broke to hear these words, but he knew what had to be done. He promised Susan that he would ride the bus with her for as long as it took until she got the hang of it. And that's exactly what happened. For two solid weeks, Mark, military uniform and all, accompanied Susan to and from work each day. 
he taught her to rely on her other senses, specifically her hearing, to determine where she was and how to adapt to her new environment. He helped her befriend the bus drivers who could watch for her and save her a seat. Mark made her laugh even on those not so good days when she would trip exiting the bus or drop her briefcase. Each morning they made the trip together by bus. After leaving Susan in front of her building, Mark would then take a cab to his office. Although this routine was even more costly and exhausting than the previous one, Mark knew that it was only a matter of time and Susan would be able to ride the bus on her own. He believed in her. He believed in the Susan he used to know before she'd lost her sight, who wasn't afraid of any challenge, who would never, ever quit. After a few weeks, Susan decided she was ready to try the trip on her own. Monday morning arrived, and before she left, she threw her arms around Mark, her temporary bus riding companion. He was her husband and her best friend. Her eyes filled with tears at gratitude for Mark's loyalty, his patience, and his love. She said goodbye, and for the first time, they went their separate ways. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, each day on her own went perfectly, and Susan never felt better. She was doing it. She was going to work all by herself. On Friday morning, Susan took the bus to work as usual. As she was waiting to exit the bus, the bus driver said, you know, I sure envy you. Susan wasn't sure what he was, that he was even speaking to her. After all, who on earth would envy a blind man who had struggled just to find the courage to live for the past year. Curiously, she asked the driver, why do you say you envy me? The driver responded, it must feel so good to be loved and protected like you are. Susan had no idea what the driver was talking about, so she asked him, what do you mean? The driver answered, every morning this week, a good-looking gentleman in a military uniform has been standing across the corner watching you get off the bus. He makes sure you cross the street safely and he watches till you enter your office building. Then he blows you a kiss, gives you a little salute and walks away. You're one lucky lady. Tears of happiness flowed down Susan's cheeks. She was blessed, so blessed for Mark had given her a gift more powerful than sight, a gift she didn't need to see to believe. He gave her the gift of love that transcends darkness. God watches over us in the same way. We may not realize that he is present. 
according to our human impressions. We may not be able to see his face or physically feel him next to us, but he is there nonetheless. He's watching. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that anyone who's within the sound of my voice will take heart and believe in you, even though you may be invisible to our human eyes. Lord, may we feel your presence. May we have the confidence that our lives are in your hands. Our future is secure in you. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.